Thank you all very much. Oh, it's much louder than I expected. <laughs> yeah, I'm usually one of those people who doesn't need a mic. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate it. So I thought in addition to talking about um, how I feel about entrepreneurship today, I'd add some thoughts about what people tell me when I tell them what they do. So it's kind of not just how do I feel, but how am I reflected back? So when I tell people about what I do, they tell me what I do is cool. Some people reflect that it's a little bit different. And some people think it's very energizing. And so this is what people tell me what I do. So let me share with you what is it that I do. So first of all, uh, I'm a product and strategy consultant. I'm an entrepreneur that helps entrepreneurs. And I've kind of pulled together a number of items to form what it is I do every day. So it's a pretty diverse set of things that I do. So the product and strategy consulting I do for both startups and larger companies. And what I do is I help them with strategic projects, such as how do I launch a new product? How do I enter a new market? Tell us how we should talk about our product. Um, strategic projects like that. And sometimes I also help them with very tactical product management and product development work. So coming in, defining a product, working with an engineering team to build it and ship it, sometimes even managing and finding that engineering team. Um, and then I also do uh, lecturing. So like I am here today, uh, I teach two classes through the Stanford Continuing Studies program. One is an entrepreneurship course that helps people figure out how to turn their idea into a business plan. And one is a course that helps people understand what product management is and learn a little bit about that. Um, in addition to the lecturing I do at Stanford, I also teach workshops through accelerators and incubators as well as companies themselves. Finally, I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching for entrepreneurs and product managers. And that's a little, it's related to what I do in my teaching, but it's on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So instead of doing, you know, actually doing the work as a consultant, I teach them how to do it as a coach. So that's what I do, and you can see that it's kind of not one job, it's kind of three jobs in one. So that might explain some of the reactions that I get. So I mentioned the, the, one of the most common reactions I get is that, wow, what you're doing is really cool. You're living the dream. These are actual quotes that I get from people. So you're living the dream. I hear from people, hey, I, I'd like to walk in your shoes someday. That sounds really cool. Um, so you all have taken the time to come here this morning on, on a Saturday morning when you could be sleeping or watching TV or any one of a number of things. So I'd love to hear a little bit from you in terms of why do you want to be entrepreneurs? Why are you interested in entrepreneurship? What do you think is cool about it? Anyone want to volunteer some thoughts? <laughs> Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. That gives opportunities for a ton of other people. Yeah. So that they can contribute and then continue to create. Absolutely. So building something new, creating something, empowering people. That's a great part of entrepreneurship. Anything else that people want to add about why they think it's interesting or why you might want to be an entrepreneur? Something cool about entrepreneurship? Any other thoughts? Okay. Well, I'll move on to, um, if you want to know kind of what the academic research says, right? This is uh, one study among many. Um, so people, what they like, they like greater autonomy, right? So that concept of being your own boss, that's very, very compelling, right? You don't have to kind of listen to someone else that you disagree with or you don't like. You get to be the boss. Um, broader skill utilization, so this is kind of similar to what I was talking about in my job, right? I don't do just one thing, and if you talk to any entrepreneur, they'll tell you they do everything from installing the DSL in the office to ordering lunches to actually going pitching funders, doing all the kind of technical work and everything that needs to be done to run a company. Um, lastly, you'll see the ability to pursue one's own idea, and I think that relates back to what you were saying, right? That ability to be creative, to make something new that you feel very passionate about. So those are some of the really cool things about being an entrepreneur. OK, so another comment that I get is, oh, before we go to that, uh, some suggestions for you in terms of, you know, you all think that entrepreneurship was cool. So I want to give you a couple of suggestions. Now, there are lots of books, great books that you can read from Steve Blank, Eric Ries, you know, Valley Legends that'll tell you steps to go through in terms of starting a business, right? So I don't want to go into kind of those tactical steps today. I want to give you a couple of just uh, personal suggestions for you. So, some of these are a little bit counterintuitive, which is why I wanted to bring them up today. So the first one is admit what you don't know, right? So that might seem a little strange, because you'll say, well, if I admit what I don't know, does that 
just doesn't that seem like I don't know what I'm doing? Um, so actually, the fear of fear is worse than the fear itself, right? And when you admit what you don't know, then you can do something about it, right? So it's actually very empowering to do that. So if you can say, for example, you know, I don't know who our target customers might be for this product. Then, if you've admitted that, you can go do some research and see, hey, we actually found that our target customer are small and medium businesses or soccer moms or whatever it is that you find, right? Um, secondly, for some of those things, you might not be able to do research, right? So when you're trying to forecast, for example, how many customers you might get, there's no crystal ball that's going to tell you that forecast. But what you can do is, first of all, in your business modeling, you can what, run what are called sensitivities. So you can see, well, if the number of customers I have is a little bit more or a little bit less than what I expected, how does that impact my business? And based on that, you can set certain guidelines. So you can see, for example, in six months' time, if we're not at this metric, we need to make some changes. So admitting what you don't know actually really makes things a lot easier for you. Second is asking for help. This is another thing that is a little bit counterintuitive. Particularly if you're a first time CEO, you might say, well, I'm supposed to be the boss. I'm running this company. I'm supposed to be the expert. If I admit what I don't know, doesn't that make me seem weak? Um, once again, I would say that rather than make you seem weak, this is actually, once again, very empowering. And the thing about admitting what you, uh, to asking for help, first of all, it helps either validate or question assumptions you have made. And it's much better to do that earlier in your process. So if you're, let's say, pulling together a pitch deck and you're not sure what the market sizing might be, would you rather go into that meeting and just say, hey, uh, this is the market size I came up with, I don't know if it's right. Or would you rather have some meetings with mentors and advisors before that meeting and say, look, I'm not really sure if I'm right with this calculation, can you help me work through it? That second option is probably gonna make you much more successful in the end. The second thing is, uh, you, when you ask for help, you also build stakeholders and champions for yourself, right? So people that you go, maybe you do a first visit with them and say, hey, I'd love to get your feedback on this idea they then become champions for you. They will be people who maybe they meet someone in their lives that could help you out. Once they know what they're doing and they like what they're doing and they believe in you, they will help you out and make introductions for you. Um, thirdly, one of the great things about Silicon Valley is that people here are very helpful and they're very willing to help. And um, really, all you lose is a word, right? By, by asking for help, all you lose is a word. There may be some times occasionally when people are too busy and they're not able to get back to you, but nine times out of ten, I think that people will be very willing to work with you. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Lastly, pay it forward, right? So put as many donations into the Karma Bank as you can as well, because you will make a lot of withdrawals when you're starting a company. So not just for the people, you know, it's, it's basic that when you ask someone for help, you try to offer help for them as well. So for example, if I go to somebody and I say, hey, I'm a product and strategy consultant, let me know if you have any projects coming up that I can help on. They may say, we don't have any projects right now, but we're looking to hire a full-time career product manager. Do you know anybody? I will actually help them. I'll post that job up. I'll mention it to people I know looking for a job. I'll try to make those connections, right? But even beyond that, try to help people that you don't have any stake in them helping you necessarily, right? Pass along the favor because you will need a lot of help. It, it takes a village to build a startup. Help everyone that you can along the way. Okay, so the second comment that people make to me is that hey, what you do is kind of different. And this is actually another quote that I've had uh, when I've described what I've done. They're like, well, that's, that's all well and good, but why aren't you just a VP somewhere, <laughs> right? Um, so I think you will see, so this is the classic Robert Frost quote. I've been to a few more graduations than you guys have, so I can tell you, you hear it a lot. And probably 40% of the college brochures you get will have this quote on it as well, right? And it's because most of those colleges want to convince you that, hey, we're the path that's less chosen and you should come here and it's going to make a real big difference for you. And one of the things they're trying to say is that taking that path less traveled is better, right? And what I want to clarify is it's not necessarily universally better. The path is different, and that means what you're trying to do is figure out, are the good things on this path worth giving up to get the good things on this, this path, right? So let me tell you specifically for me, since I've taken this different path, I did start at big companies, right? So when I first signed down uh, at Disney, so this was my first job out of college, first of all, 
Um, Disney, you know, their reputation, there's, it's, people have heard of this company, they're impressed by it. So even my grandmother, who lives in a rural village in India, when my parents told her that's where I'm going to go work, she was impressed, right? Because not only had she heard of Disney, but she, she knew that it was a good, great, strong multinational company. And so it was seen as a real uh, coup for me to get a job there. So there's that kind of name and reputation effect of working at a large company. The second thing is that there's some great perks at working at big companies. So as soon as I accepted my offer on the phone, the next day I got an overnight package from LA and it was huge. And it has this like three foot tall Mickey Mouse, uh, stuffed Mickey Mouse and a bottle of champagne, which made me very popular among my friends. Um, and it was much better than the champagne we would have bought at the corner store. Uh, so, so that was, um, so you know, you get perks like that once I started working with them. I'm traveling business class, I'm staying at fancy hotels. I had an administrative assistant. You know, my friends would get a call, kick out of just calling me up and being like, oh my gosh, there was a secretary who answered your phone. <laughs> um, so they're great, you know, they're perks like that, that I've, you know, I don't have an administrative assistant anymore. So what, I guess what I'm trying to say is, what you're trying to do is something different and just make sure that you're happy about, you know, the things that you're, the good things you're getting on the, on the different path are making up for the things that you might miss on the path that you were on. And to reiterate that, I showed you a study earlier that talked about some of the benefits that people find from entrepreneurship. Another sentence in this study was basically that entrepreneurship does not quite generally not pay in monetary terms. So one of the things I tell people that take my class, I would love for all of you to become millionaires, but it might not happen, right? So get into entrepreneurship, not because you're expecting to be a millionaire, but because you're excited about the journey. And those things that we talked about previously in terms of having your independence, being creative, playing a lot of roles, creating something new, make sure that that excites you. And that's the reason to do this. So finally, um, a comment that I get is that I'm very full of energy. And what's actually funny is, not only do I get this comment from people who maybe like me, but I get it from people who have some critical things to say about me as well. So what I've put up here are some quotes. When I teach, I get course reviews, right? And most of the reviews are very positive. It's a great course, outstanding class, et cetera. But there will be co critical comments as well. And so you'll see here, there was one person, you know, they wanted a textbook for, for the class, and I don't teach with a textbook, and they were disappointed by that. But even with, in the midst of those negative comments, they end with on the positive side she was very energetic <laughs> so I get that from both people who like me and people who don't like me um, and I want to give you a taste of where that energy comes from for me so if you'll just indulge me in a quick exercise here um, I'd love for you to just for the next few seconds or so just close your eyes and I want you to just imagine a time when you really felt in the zone, in the flow, right? So this could be anything. It could be, it could be something school related, like you really like a book and you're writing a report about it and it's really just, just flowing onto the computer for you. Uh, it could be you're, you're really into sports and you just scored a goal and you feel like you could score 10 more. It could be you're playing an orchestra and you just really feel like this is working for you. And just feel in your body what that's like, right? So what are you smelling? What are you tasting? How do your fingertips feel? How does your heart feel? How are you breathing? How does your gut feel? What do you feel like when you're in the zone? Okay? Just take a minute to think about that. Now, imagine if you could have that feeling every day when you work. That's what entrepreneurship is for me. I'm not saying that everything is great and it's just, you know, pixies and roses and every, everything is just working out the way I want. No. But even when I come across problems, I'm excited to solve them. And that's what this opportunity has given me. And so I want to kind of encourage you to find the intersection of what you're good at, what you like doing, and then what your job needs. And through many iterations, I feel like I've been able to find that for myself, and I think that is the source of the energy for me. So what are some ways to do this? So first of all, be authentic, right? So think about what do you really like doing? And this may not be what your parents expect you to do or your friends think is cool or what some article says is gonna be the next big career. Think about what really drives you, be authentic. Be open to new experiences, right? So, you know, I like to 
use some of your young folk uh, lingo. It's, it's YOLO, right? You're only here once. Try some new things. When you're in school, go do a study abroad program if you can. Take a class that isn't in your major. Try different things. Push your boundaries. So I was lucky enough when I was in college to uh, have an ability to have an internship for a summer in Japan. And it was amazing. And, you know, there are the obvious things that happen, right? My Japanese obviously got a lot better than just sitting in a classroom and trying to learn Japanese. But um, what also happened was, you know, you, you make mistakes along the way and you learn a lot about yourself and others through those mistakes. So I was pretty jet lagged. It was kind of the first or second day I'd gotten there. And I had a host family there who took very good care of me and they were kind enough when I got there to have a welcome party. Um, and they invited a bunch of people from work and around to just come and meet me and, and uh, welcome me. And uh, I happen to be vegetarian, which can be a little bit of a challenge in Japan. But they were very kind and they said, oh, these are edamame, they're vegetarian, and they put this huge bowl in front of me, right? I had never seen these before. And so I thought they were like snap peas or something, you know, just like snow peas or sweet peas or something. And I just took the whole pod and stuck it in my mouth. And I'm sitting there chewing it. Probably a half an hour goes by where I'm trying to kind of hide the fact that I've tried to eat something that's actually not edible. Somebody finally took pity on me and I think they gave me a napkin and took care of the problem. But, you know, so what did I learn from that, right? Well, first of all, you learn that new things that you counter may not have, you know, the same solutions as old things that you've encountered, right? So edamame are not snow peas. Um, second thing I learned is you know, I was really nervous about this. I was meeting all these new people. I wanted to be perfect. I wanted to be right on, and I messed up. And you know what? It was okay. In fact, it was better than okay, because this was a good icebreaker for us. This really actually endeared me to this community. And even years later, they'd be like, oh, remember that time you ate that whole edamame? That was really funny. So they came to like me because of that. And the third thing is, it gives you compassion for other people, right? So when other people make mistakes, maybe you don't think, oh man, they're an idiot, or they didn't do the right preparation. You just say, hey, maybe this is something new for them. What can I do to help them? So when you try new things, right, you might not like all of them. You might not like many of them. That's OK. You'll still learn from the things you don't like. And every once in a while, you're going to find something you liked that you didn't think you would, and that's going to be really, really special. So finally, I'd say, be willing to experiment. And experimentation is not just about trying new things, which we just talked about. Experimentation is about iteration, right? So Archimedes took a lot of baths before he figured his, you know, before he had his eureka moment. He's, he took a lot of baths, right? So when you experiment, that means that if a scientist does an experiment and, it, and, and the hypothesis does not come through in the results, they don't just throw up their hands and say, I'm not going to be a scientist anymore, right? They say, okay, let me, maybe the hypothesis was wrong, let me try this other hypothesis, I'm gonna run a new experiment, right? So maybe when you start your first startup, it's not gonna be successful. That's pretty common, right? The conclusion from not is not, oh, I'm just a disaster at this, right? You should look back on it and say, first of all, did I like doing this? And if you think that, hey, this was a really exciting and interesting experience for me, do it again and do it differently. Maybe you do a different idea, a different approach, a different team. There are a lot of things you can change to try to be more successful the second time. So don't keep iterating. Iteration is the key to success. Finally, uh, I just wanted to kind of put this up in case you were interested. So Eckerd College in Florida did what they called was an entrepreneurial dimension profile. And they did a number of tests, similar to if, you, if any of you have done things like Myers-Briggs tests, a uh, number of questions that they ask you, and from that they try to glean insights into your personality. And they surveyed both entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs. And what they found, they, they used 14 different personality characteristics here. And they found that in these first 13, entrepreneurs consistently score above non-entrepreneurs. And then in the 14th one, interpersonal sensitivity, uh, entrepreneurs consistently scored lower <laughs> than uh, non-entrepreneurs. And I think there's some interesting results here, right? So first of all, people think that entrepreneurs are all about vision. And it's true that you need to be that idea generator. But you also need that ability to execute, right? Startups are really 90% execution, and that's important. Um, and I think the interpersonal sensitivity goes back to some of the things we just talked about, that you're not afraid of failure, you're going to try new things, there are going to be certain things that don't work out. That doesn't mean you're a bad person, it just means you try it again in a different way. So to conclude, when people hear what I do, they say it's cool, it's a little bit different, and you seem really full of energy. And that 
I would say that in giving up the things that were on the big company path, I gained a lot of really cool things on the entrepreneurial path, and that's been able to unleash a lot of potential and energy in me that I didn't know I had. So I want to encourage you to go out and try the same, and hopefully you'll get the same results. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Rashmi. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, most liked question, in your experience, what do entrepreneurs need help with the most? So I think it's actually, some of it is that uh, uh, business planning at the beginning, right? So time after time, I have entrepreneurs who come to me and they're like, okay, um, so I want to quit my job and start this business. What should I do? And I always tell people, before you qu quit your job, ask yourself some questions, right? Um, are you really solving a customer need? Are you solving it in a way that's different from other people? Are you solving it in a way that's gonna give you a big market size and an ability to generate revenue? So some of that planning and particularly thinking about how do you acquire customers? Um, people I think feel like it's a build it and they'll come type of situation, right? So I have a great idea, I'm really creative, I'm gonna build this company, people are gonna love it, right? But you need to think about how are they gonna find out about you and why are they gonna buy your product? And so I would say some of that thinking up front is actually helpful. Okay, do you have a memory of a certain product you felt would succeed but didn't, or vice versa? Well, I started a business <laughs> that didn't succeed. Um, so, you know, I think you'll talk to a lot of entrepreneurs who had that experience. So, uh, my, my green business was one where we were trying to help school districts go green. And we were trying to capture that wave back in 2008 where not only was green hot, but there was a lot of funding coming towards green. And so particularly, there was a lot of government funding to help school districts go green. And that was part of the reason we got involved in that uh, through a variety of reasons, you know, uh, which I won't bore you with right now. A lot of it has to do with like how public schools are funded here and so on. Um, we ran into some challenges, but it set me on the path I'm on now. So even though that, didn't, that business didn't work, I now devote my life to entrepreneurship, and I wouldn't have if I didn't give that try. Okay, we've heard earlier that a business education, specifically for business, is not fundamental to becoming a successful entrepreneur. What are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, business school, uh, so if you're thinking about MBAs and so on down the line, um, it's, it's, it's different, right? So you have to go to medical school to be a doctor, you have to go to law school to be a lawyer, you don't have to go to business school to be in business. There are definitely valuable things that come with an MBA, uh, including the network, the reputation, and getting some of those analytical frameworks, and even just a way of presenting yourself and a way of talking that I think comes, comes out of that experience of going to business school. Also, if your background or the work that you did originally was not in business, going to business school can help you get that. So if you were an engineer, or you were in the army, or you were in a nonprofit, or you were an artist, but you're interested now in entrepreneurship or business, going to business school can give you that framework and, and setup that you need to, be, to, to become an entrepreneur. On the other side, though, I would say there are plenty of stories of people who have been successful entrepreneurs without going to business school. So I would say it's neither a requirement nor a hindrance. Okay, uh, uh, so a lot of us are in our high school and we're starting to think about internships in college. So do you believe that internships are beneficial for entrepreneurs in the making or do they just simply hinder you? I think, inter I think internships can actually be very valuable. And keep in mind, your internship does not necessarily have to be at a startup, right? Um, Internships are valuable because they give you, you, you learn how to interact in a work environment, you learn how people do a certain job, and I would actually say that sometimes doing that in a big company is actually better because you will get very good structure, you'll get process, you'll be able to work with people who have managed people for a long time, and so they'll be able to give you really good tips and mentor you in a really good way. Whereas sometimes I know that people who do internships in startups, the startup's so busy just trying to stay above water and do what it needs to do that you as an intern might not get much attention. So I highly recommend internships. They don't necessarily have to be at a startup. Okay, what advice do you have for aspiring entrepreneurs in high school in regards to overcoming difficulties such as legal issues and experience and finances? Right, um, so I'm not a lawyer, so it's a little bit difficult for me to say. Um, so I, I, it's a little bit hard. I wasn't an entrepreneur in high school, so it's a little bit hard for me to answer that question. I would encourage you to talk to people who were entrepreneurs in high school, but I would say that in general, you know, if you feel, for example, that financing is a barrier, maybe try to choose topics and businesses that don't require outside funding to get started, right? So there's nothing that says you must have venture funding when you're a startup. So there may be businesses that you can create that are self-sustaining and, and um, don't need funding to start out with. And then maybe as you get towards college or you know, that level, you can then start to look into funding. 
what is the most common reason uh, entrepreneurs fail? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know that I'll point to one necessarily, right? So the first thing I'll say is there are a lot of things you don't control. And this is why I'm encouraging you, if you do start a business and it doesn't work out, don't beat yourself up because you, you probably know yourself, right? Great restaurant opens in your city. You love it. The food is great. The service is good. And yet, what happens? The restaurant fails. Does, is it because it was a bad restaurant? No. Maybe there was a recession. Maybe another restaurant opened up next door. You don't know. So what you can do to help yourself is do some of this business planning we've talked about um, and that'll help you at least know what your risks are and start to try to manage towards those but i would say a lot of the things you don't control um, and then from the things you do control why are some of the reasons people have problems uh, lack of product market fit um, team issues can also be a problem right so um, definitely that interpersonal relationships and making sure they have the right team to build a business um, are very important and how did you transition from working at a company like Walt Disney uh, to becoming a product and strategy consultant? Yeah, so I basically, yeah, I didn't, I guess I didn't get into all the detail on my career path, but yeah, so I, uh, my undergraduate was at Harvard and I, I majored in economics. And then through on-campus recruiting, I got my job at Disney. And that was a strat uh, strategic planning role. And I did that for four years, three years in the US and one year in Japan. And then I actually came back to business school. And so for me, actually, business school helped me make that transition from entertainment industry to technology. Uh, what I also tried to do was the first product that I worked on in the technology space was an entertainment related, related product. It was digital video recorders. Um, and so uh, basically, business school helped me get an internship at Microsoft. Um, and so I did that and then joined them later on. And, and that's how that happened. And then um, after about six or seven years at big companies like Microsoft and Yahoo, I did my green business for a couple years. Then I was VP of product at a couple of startups, um, one of which, which was sold. Um, and then I decided that what I really wanted to do was work with a lot of different startups at the same time. And that's why I transitioned into starting a consulting firm. Okay, we're going to go ahead and open up to the floor. Does anybody have any questions for her? What would you define um, a business plan as being? I know some people believe it's a comprehensive, like 20 page plan, and other people believe you can just write it on a napkin. So I was just wondering what your opinion on that was. So I would say it's probably somewhere in between that, right? So I don't think a napkin is enough, um, but I don't want people to feel daunted by the fact that, oh my gosh, now I have to go write this thing, right? It's the, the writing of it or the presentation of it is not what's as important to me. It's the thinking that goes into it, right? So thinking about like, well, what is the market size? Of the business we're going into. Who is our target customer? What's the need? How am I going to charge for this thing? How am I going to find customers? What's my cost structure? Am I going to be able to acquire customers for less money than I actually make from them? Those are the types of questions you want to answer. And so it does take a little bit of time and a little bit of research, but I actually think that it will make you more successful going forward if you do some of that, because at least the risk that you control will be better off then. Right? Yeah. So in my class, we do 10, 10, pace, 10 slides. 10 slide business plans, so you know, somewhere in between your napkin and, and 20 plus pages. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Last call. Okay, all right, thank you very much, Rashmi. Thank you very much.